This recording captures one of three presentations delivered on March 31st, 2021 to members and guests of the Waikato branch of the New Zealand Institute of Primary Industry Management. The aim is to extend the relevant science and understanding of organic soils with farmers, agricultural advisors and rural professionals to support effective management of peat soils. Um, the, the work that I'm going to talk about today is um, associated with an international um, program uh, called PeatWise. And PeatWise was a consortium of research institutes and researchers from mainly northern European countries, countries where um, substantial areas of peatlands have been farmed or used for forestry for often hundreds of years, and where um, uh, these peatlands are major sources of greenhouse gases that contribute to the national um, greenhouse gas inventory. So um, I was lucky to be um, invited to join that consortium. And it was a bit strange thinking about Northern Europe uh, and New Zealand. Um, and funding uh, came from the New Zealand government via um, the Ministry for Primary Industries as, as part of this. So there was a lot of learning to be gained uh, from going to Europe and uh, working with these colleagues. Overall, um, PeatWise had the aim of to advance the wise management of drained peatlands in order to minimise greenhouse gas emissions while still maintaining biomass production. Um, so there was a big focus on testing mitigations and, and uh, Jack will cover some of those in, in the next session. I sort of looked at it and realised that there was such a lack of uh, basic science information about what emissions were from New Zealand peatlands um, that really we need to, to, to be a bit more, um, uh, to gather some more fundamental information. So the New Zealand research aims were to, um, hopefully to improve the New Zealand greenhouse gas inventory for peat soils, um, particularly for dairy farming, since that's the major use, especially in this region and to begin to evaluate the mitigation potential of uh, improved water table management. So I'm going to touch on those issues. And why is this important? Um, the New Zealand uh, greenhouse gas inventory uses tier one approaches for estimating greenhouse gas emissions from peat soils. Tier one is the real basic level when you have no other information. Um, and. Uh, countries are encouraged to move up to higher tier levels once more information is gathered. Um, so what we're trying to do is uh, get some evidence together which um, can help uh, Ministry for Primary Industries and Ministry for the Environment to improve their greenhouse gas accounting methods. Um, and in particular, um, well, Justin's already talked about the ongoing carbon losses from organic soil, so that was one thing that we wanted to look at. Um, presently, carbon losses from organic soils are not in agriculture, they're in the land use, land use change and forestry sector. They seem to be a function of a land use change, except that they're ongoing, they don't transition to a new state. Uh, in contrast, nitrous oxide or N2O emissions um, are covered within the agriculture sector and, and many of you will be familiar with the fact that nitrous oxide emission comes from uh, application of nitrogen fertilisers, urine and dung from grazing animals. Um, there is another type of um, N2O emission that happens, particularly associated with organic soils, that's from the mineralisation of organic matter through the decay process which releases both carbon and nitrogen that's been stored for potentially thousands of years, some of that nitrogen can then get emitted as nitrous oxide. So there's a separate emission factor within the inventory, and it's a very large number, about eight kilograms of nitrous oxide in per hectare per year. And so really we need to examine whether that's a, uh, a suitable value. Um, methane emissions from drained peatlands uh, generally are thought to be quite small, except around uh, drains and, and very moist soils or flooded soils um, at some times of the year. And, and this knowledge will also uh, inform mitigation research. So let's just have a look at um, peat soils one on one. What happens when we drain uh, a peat wetland where peat has been accumulating for thousands of years to these great depths that um, 
Justin talked about, and the Waikato depths of uh, as much as 12 to 14 metres have been recorded. And that's this organic matter which has been accumulated from carbon dioxide from, from the atmosphere for, for thousands of years. So when we convert this to, a, say, a grassland by lowering the water table, that enables the plant roots to get in the ground. We improve the soil chemistry so it's much more suitable for um, uh, productive production plants such as um, pasture or crops. Um, so there's still a big input of CO2 from the atmosphere into any living uh, vegetation system uh, through photosynthesis. Um, and, but most of that will get returned back to the atmosphere. And this is the same for any vegetation ecosystem. Um, so what goes on within uh, peat once you've drained it, once you've withdrawn the water and allowed oxygen to enter the upper part of the peat profile is that the microorganisms can start rapidly decaying that ancient organic matter, breaking it down into smaller carbon molecules, releasing um, some of it, or, or much of it is CO2, so this is where the, the extra CO2 emissions come from, from drained peatlands, and some nitrogen that is locked up in that organic matter is also released, and a fraction of that is emitted as nitrous oxide. So there's a, an emission factor for this within the um, New Zealand uh, inventory. Below the water table, the, a much slower rate of organic matter decay by microorganisms occur, and this can produce, or this produces methane. But when the water table is quite a long way below the surface, um, most of that methane is oxidised to CO2 on its way back to the surface. So generally we don't have very large methane emissions or not significant methane emissions once we've drained the peat. However, in intact peatland we can get um, substantial methane emissions. Um, this changes if the water table comes close to the surface, say within about 10 centimetres of the surface, uh, a lot more of that methane can escape. So farming peat, there's a, there's a real challenge with managing the water table here, or the hydrology. Um, it, in, at wet times of the year, uh, farmers need to remove this water quickly. Um, so that's largely what the drainage network is set up around, to encourage water to get out of there after a wet winter or early spring, so it encourages rapid um, pasture growth, avoids pugging, because you don't want animals on very soft soils, and uh, additionally, uh, removing that water should reduce any methane emissions from the soil. Um, however, you actually want to retain that water through the drier times of the year. Peats, uh, peters, um, when things start drying out, uh, the, pore, the small pore sizes in peat really hold on to the water so that plants can't extract it. So plants generally um, have, have trouble growing through dry conditions where a neighbouring soil on um, uh, mineral soils, the plants might keep growing a lot longer. So for optimal plant growth, you really want to hold the water back um, and that will, uh, should help reduce the oxidation and uh, N2O emissions and CO2 emissions. So maintaining a shallow water uh, table is the key. And that would help minimise shrinkage and CO2 emissions and improve plant production in dry season. So there's a real win-win there. The problem is it's technically very difficult and Jack will talk about some of the issues here. So we've drained most of our peat wetlands in the Waikato and uh, um, Justin showed where the remaining areas of wetlands are. The biggest one is um, Kapuatai peat dome in the lower Hauraki which is about 10,000 hectares in size the largest remaining more or less intact peatland in the, in the country. So if you like, that's the reference ecosystem uh, for our farmed peatlands. If we were ever going to restore them, that this would be the target that we're heading um, back to. Um, our research group's been working on Kapuotai along with um, ecologists like Bev Clarkson for quite a few years. Um, and we've, we've had the site operating um, since about 2011. Jordan Goodrich did his PhD um, based there. And what we're doing there is we're measuring the exchanges of CO2 and methane between the, the living um, peat, peatland 
underneath our instruments and the atmosphere. So we're measuring on a day-by-day -day basis that uptake of CO2 by the vegetation, the release at night time, in other words, the breathing of this ecosystem, um, inhaling CO2 during the day and exhaling some at night time, keeping a running balance of that so that on a day-by-day, season-by-season, annual basis, uh, basis, we can calculate the total amount of CO2. Um, and this ecosystem is a, is a substantial sink for CO2 because it's a healthy functioning peatland. Um, but it also emits methane, which is uh, because we've got a shallow water table here, lots of organic matter, so methane bubbles up out and, and goes um, past our instruments. And we have sensors up on our mast here that measure both the CO2 and methane. In terms of trying to capture a carbon balance, do a full accounting of the ins and outs of carbon in this ecosystem, we have to use this approach, which is the <coughs> net ecosystem carbon balance equation. It's simply summing up the total uptake of CO2, subtract the amount of methane, if you like, um, and um, subtract the amount of DOC. Obviously, there's a sign convention here. Um, there is dissolved organic carbon leaching out of this ecosystem, and so we estimate that as well. So we'll come back to some uh, later on, we'll just compare the sort of values we get for that ecosystem compared to what's going on in pasture. So we can apply the same approach to uh, drained peatland. The problem is uh, a managed peatland such as a farm is far more complicated than a peat bog because we have these great beasts wandering around, which what they're doing is transporting carbon. They're taking it away from our paddocks, so they're eating dry matter which is grown uh, on, on, on the peat surface and they're taking it away but they're also depositing carbon in dung and urine. So let's have a look at what the, um, the, the pasture uh, carbon balance looks like. We've still got a, a, a very large uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere, in fact much larger than a natural peatland because of course it's a much um, more nutrient rich ecosystem. We've got plants which are have been adapted or chosen for their ability to sequester a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere. So we're talking probably about 25 tonnes of carbon taken up every year through photosynthesis, but most of it's released again, um, going back out as uh, respired CO2 from the plants or from the underlying peat as it's oxidising. So we um, can use the same methods that we used in the peatland to um, measure these. Now in terms of the cows, what they're doing is they're vehicles for transporting carbon around. And so they're excreting carbon, uh, carbon from pasture that they've eaten either in this paddock or some other part of the farm or supplemental feed that they've eaten after milking. Um, and then they're grazing, so they're taking away some of the product of this photosynthesis and either depositing it again or taking it out the gate and turning that into product, milk or meat, and eventually exits the farm gate. Um, again, there's uh, carbon in, in drainage water, which is heading out through the drain, so we need to be able to estimate that. Uh, and there are other um, ex uh, imports of carbon going on as well, for example, <coughs> lime, manure, or supplemental feed, depending on uh, the, the farming system. If we summed all these things up into the, uh, the net carbon balance calculation, uh, at the end of the day the number we get will tell us about how the soil carbon stock has changed. So if we end up with a uh, negative number that means we've lost carbon and that loss of carbon will eventually turn to CO2 <coughs> so it's accounted as a CO2 loss. So let's think about other greenhouse gas emissions and uh, um, in the, in the wetland situation I talked about methane. Well methane should be a pretty minor component for the pasture system, but I'll, I'll talk about some sources of that in a minute. In a natural peatland, uh, our raised bogs are rain fed, so they're amongst the lowest nutrient ecosystems on the planet. Okay, so nitrous oxide emissions uh, are totally negligible, or generally found to be negligible. Um, however, since we've lowered the water table, uh, organic matter is decaying, that's releasing uh, stored nitrogen, and some of that will be uh, converted through to nitrous oxide, 
So there's a source of nitrous oxide here. Uh, if we've got uh, flooded or um, high water table areas such as along the drains, then methane might be being produced. But our drains tend to occupy a pretty small proportion of our drain peatland, so it's probably quite a small uh, emission source. Somewhere like Muggeridge is um, where they're, they're having trouble uh, keeping the water table uh, down, is probably uh, generating quite a lot of methane through this source. Um, cow urine uh, depositing um, nitrogen onto the soil, a fraction of that will be converted to nitrous oxide and this is exactly the same for any um, type of soil, whether it's a, a mineral soil or an organic soil. Uh, Fertilisers such as urea, um, a fraction of those will produce nitrous oxide. Dung uh, can produce both nitrous oxide uh, and methane. And these are, are accounted for in the, in the standard inventory practice. And of course, the girls here are burping out methane as well. And that's accounted for in the New Zealand greenhouse gas emission um, uh, inventory. Okay, so we have a particular interest in figuring out what's just happening for the pasture and soil uh, part of this, this budget. Uh, and for that we treat the cows a little bit differently than, than we do for looking at the entire paddock or farming system when we've got the cows involved. And you'll see two sets of numbers a little bit later on. So we use the same sorts of instruments and um, setups as we do in the wetland. So we're measuring the fluxes of um, CO2 at, and methane um, at, uh, here as we did in, in the wetland. Nitrous oxide is a really tricky one to measure because the atmospheric concentration is so low. Um, so for that we use a, um, that and, and methane, we use a special laser instrument which is um, sitting in this box over here and we have to power that with mains power and it's got a very uh, electricity hum hungry um, vacuum pump to run it. But we are able to make accurate measurements of both methane and nitrous oxide um, fluxes. So we have one site where we're measuring all three gases and another site where we're measuring just CO2. And these were on two farms at Moana Tuatua. So let's just look at the study period. We made measurements over two years from October uh, 2018 through to the end of September 2020. So two, two study years. Um, and um, those were, those were characterised by having, uh, both having quite dry summers. Uh, we had a very wet December 2018, but then the subsequent months were very dry, and that's led to um, low pasture production. And the water table shown down here at the two sites uh, dropped down quite deeply to uh, around 1400 millimetres at one site, and then it stabilised at about 1250 at the other site. These are incredibly deep water tables. Um, the IPCC um, classifies a, water, a mean water table deeper than 300 millimetres as, uh, as, as very deep. Um, mean water tables here are between 600 and 800 millimetres deep um, because we have these very dry summers. Uh, we had a very short normal rainfall period uh, towards the end of uh, or in winter 2019 and then an early start to dry. And we had this severe dry or drought period last year which lasted through to about um, April, uh, March or April. So that was the setting, we had two very dry summers and um, actually not, uh, not too much rainfall in the winter in between. Uh, one of the other things we were trying to do was trying to understand the roles of uh, drains. And it turns out that from my observation, drains don't always have water in it, they only function uh, to remove water for relatively small portions of the year when it's very wet um, and for much of the time they're pretty much empty or the water's not moving anywhere. So the reason that the water table goes down in summer has actually got nothing to do with the drains. It's because evaporation exceeds precipitation. So this is, is the result of the, what we call the vertical water balance. Not enough rain um, to um, replace all the water that's being evaporated. Okay. One thing that we did discover is that um, there are, is a substantial saturated zone above the water table, often to within about 
uh, four or 500 millimetres of the surface, even when the water table is as deep as 1,200 millimetres deep. The peat above it is still saturated. Um, it's just that in uh, many cases, the plants aren't really accessing that, probably because of pH problems. Okay, so let's look at um, the, the CO2 fluxes for these two farm sites. And I'll just show you the first year first, uh, initially. These curves show the cumulative CO2 exchange with units of tonnes of carbon within the CO2 per hectare. Um, and initially, so in the, in the spring of um, 2018 and early summer, our two sites behaved almost identically. Grass was growing, taking up lots of CO2. The little jagged um, uh, shapes here are because of grazing, so the cows are taking off biomass, so that reduces um, photosynthesis. And then after the wet December, things started to turn around and dry out. And that's where things got really interesting. Um, these cumulative curves show that these two sites started behaving very, very differently. What was happening at site one is the soil dried down so far that not just the pasture stopped growing, but the microbes appeared to stop um, functioning. And so respiration rates from the peat reduced. And then uh, it wasn't until things wetted up in winter that um, pasture started growing again and taking up CO2. But um, ironically, it got to a net balance of zero. So it lost as much CO2 as it had gained earlier in the year. Whereas site two, had this massive loss of CO2 or carbon from CO2 right through that dry period and then really only just started to recover um, by the end of that first year. Um, so, so this was quite um, uh, confronting really, how we could get such big differences. Um, so it was almost reassuring that the next year, which was even drier, we just saw a repeat of exactly the same pattern, except even more so. So the site which had zeroed uh, at the end of the first year um, had lost about two and a half tonnes by the end of the second year. Just note that the, um, I've re-zeroed both sites at the beginning of the second year. In the second uh, site two, we lost around eight and a half tonnes of carbon uh, by the end of that year. So big impact of dry conditions and it suggests that there's quite a lot of spatial variability but we're not quite sure of all of the reasons. So we saw very similar CO2 fluxes under moist conditions and then those fluxes converged uh, enormously under dry conditions. Um, our other measurements and analysis show us that soil moisture dynamics were quite a key factor and that seemed to be the major factor between the two sites. There were differences in peak bulk density and probably on uh, fine scale porosity which probably affected vertical transfers of water within the soil profile. Um, but the reason that exists we're not quite sure. It could be time since the initial development, so um, a different uh, development pathway for the peat, um, physical properties, or re more recent land use history. And so it'll be interesting to see what we could learn because if we could reduce these massive emissions to near zero, or at least reduce them in really dry years and still produce pastures, we'd be onto a pretty good uh, mitigation. Um, so let's just sum up the numbers in terms of our overall carbon balance. Um, and these, are, these numbers are averaged for our two farm sites. Um, so the amount of carbon coming in from excreta, we estimated to be 2.3 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Uh, and in reverse, almost five tonnes of carbon went out the gate. Um, as pasture removed by the cows, only a very small amount of leaching, only about 250 kilograms per hectare over the year. Um, average between those two sites, about two and a half tonnes of net CO2 loss. Okay, so if we add those together, or we subtract the, the exports of carbon from the import, um, we get a net carbon balance of 5.4 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year. And that's a loss of carbon, which we would interpret as being the, the loss of carbon from the peat body itself. Okay, so what about, what, what, what sort of numbers do we see on mineral soils? So we've, we've got long-term sites over near Matamata on a dairy farm on mineral soils. 
and on average, uh, the net CO2 flux, which is this one, has got the opposite sign. So it's the CO2 heading in the other direction of about three tonnes per hectare every year. So the plants are taking up carbon and putting it into the soil, but then a lot of that's walking back out the gate. And so the net balance, this number, is about zero. But that's a pretty good scenario, really, for an intensively farmed system. Some years lose, some, some years gain. Okay. The scary thing is when we convert these numbers to CO2 emissions and you use a multiplier of 3.7 to get from carbon to CO2, so 5.4 tonnes of carbon is equivalent to about 20 tonnes of CO2 per hectare emitted um, on average between our two sites. Okay, so some quite big numbers there. Um, so let's just quickly look at the N2O emissions. Um, I put this up because it just shows the scale of our measurements that we're making. We're making measurements every half hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days in a year. Um, it looks a bit messy until you can see that um, there are these definite peaks in uh, nitrous oxide emission. And they coincide, they, they coincide with the first rainfall after a grazing event. So the cows are depositing urine and dung um, uh, that's going into the soil, some nitrogen transformations are happening, and then it rains and the conditions are prime for N2O emissions. So that accounts for quite a bit of the emissions. And we also see changes in the background emission at different times of year, again, um, mainly tied in with moisture content. So when we sum all of this up, um, we end up with annual totals of nitrous oxide emission. So for our first year, 2018 to 19, spring to spring, about 4.1 kilograms of nitrous oxide in per hectare and a bit more in the second year, 5.1. Okay. The surprising thing with this is it was much, much lower than we were expecting to find. In that same uh, farm site near Matamata with mineral soils, we get about 7 to 8 kilograms of nitrous oxide in per hectare per year. So that, that was a surprising result. So what we attempted to do was tease apart that overall number because we're just measuring the total amount of nitrous oxide go past and we know that it comes from a variety of sources. So we used some of the standard inventory approaches to calculate what we would expect from these systems in terms of nitrous oxide from fertiliser, dung and urine given our farm um, uh, management data and then subtract the total of those from our total measured emission and the leftover bit we attribute to the, um, the methane sourced from mineralisation of organic matter. And we get these numbers here. For site one, uh, a little bit more than one kilogram, and for the other site about four and a half kilograms of nitrous oxide in. And the interesting thing is these numbers are far smaller than the standard number that's used in the New Zealand inventory, which is eight kilograms. So there's a little bit of head scratching on, going on here but also a suggestion that we need to do a lot more work and improve the New Zealand inventory. So some of the reasons um, could be that the default, well I know the default emission factor is actually for high nutrient peatlands. A lot of these values were uh, measured in Europe, lowland peatlands in Europe where you've got very high nutrient contents, much different than our peatlands. So we might be just using the wrong factor. Um, and other studies have found similar small into our emissions in low nutrient peat. So I think we're on to something there. So just summing it all up quickly, here's some, just a different way of looking at these numbers. So when we, when we farm uh, a drained peatland, we're getting these sorts of numbers. So this is, this is firstly just the, uh, the total greenhouse gas budget presented in terms of tonnes of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. It includes CO2, nitrous oxide, and a small bit of methane that we measured from the pasture and peat itself. But it's dominated about 95% by CO2 emissions. Um, if we took this total amount and we assumed that some sort of a average for a, for, a, for a farm and multiply it by $30 a tonne, you're looking at about $630 a, a hectare just as well you're not being charged for it yet. Okay, if we then um, put on top of this the farming system, so that's mainly the methane emissions from uh, the, the cows and 
uh, a little bit more nitrous oxide because of the, the fertilizers going on, then that goes up to about 30 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year. So how does this compare with our, uh, um, our intact wetland? So here's the um, peat and pasture part of the greenhouse balance, gas balance, about 21 tonnes of CO2 per hectare. And here's the grazing system one. Well, for the bog, it's a net sink, so I've got a negative sign here, but it's quite a small number. And it's composed of quite a large uptake of CO2 and then a small but significant release of methane, and methane is, has got a powerful warming influence, so it um, counters a lot of that CO2, but the CO2 uptake is still sufficient enough that this place is a, is a greenhouse gas sink consistently year on year. And it's very resilient to drain. So just in summary, um, drain peatland greenhouse gas emissions are dominated by CO2 loss, from the peat, um, which we estimate to be more than 90% for just the peat and pasture system, and probably a, a bit more than 70% for the whole farm system. So CO2 emissions are, are large and variable from site to site, especially during these dry years, and we're not sure of all the reasons, but um, subsurface hydrology is, is um, important. N2 emissions are surprisingly low, so we need to do some work to um, improve the New Zealand inventory on this. Um, so mitigation focus really should um, focus on these large CO2 emissions. And I'll finish there. Thank you.